This is Book TV's Afterwards podcast. This week, a conversation with John Fabian Witt. We first brought you this conversation on November 15th. The Yale Law Professor talks about his book, American Contagions, Epidemics and the Law from Smallpox to COVID-19. He examines the relationship between the law, epidemics, and public health guidelines. Interviewed by Georgetown University Law Professor and Director of the Institute for National and Global Health Law, Lawrence Gostin. Uh, hi, uh, I've got with me a wonderful uh, author who has written a fantastic book, John Fabian Witt. Uh, John, uh, you're a distinguished uh, law scholar and distinguished historian, and you've given us a book for the ages, exactly at the right time we need it in the midst of a pandemic. Um, And so you've said that you wanting, that your goal is to do a citizen's guide. Um, What did you mean by that? Well, uh, great question. I I wanted to write a book um, that would be a first draft of the history of the law of epidemics for the era of COVID and beyond. Uh, but that would be, it would speak to an interested reader, not just the specialists in the field. Um, uh, there, there are lots of specialists in the field, and I thought my value added might be to translate from specialists in the field to, um, to readers who are just fascinated by the, the blizzard of legal issues uh, that, that have arisen just in the last six months that, that weren't really on most people's agenda in, in, until now. No, and of course, we, it, it also... You know, we never thought about past epidemics, but we're certainly thinking about them now, uh, particularly, you know, what can we learn from them and, you know, what do we know when it's going to be over? But I want to begin, John, if I can, um, really at the, at the end of your book, and then I'm going to pivot back at the end of our interview to, to ask you more about this question. But you write, you know, America has two histories one ugly, uh, the other far more appealing. In the months and years ahead, Americans will hold the power between them. Let's hold they ma- hope they make the right choice. Now, I'm going to be asking you more about what that right choice is at the end of our interview. But for now, I just wanted to know, you know, what is the ugly part of America and what's the appealing part? That's a great question. That, that's really what came out for me in these historical materials was these two histories. Um, let, let, let's start with the ugly part, just you know, get right to it. Um, the ugly part is a, a really dreadful history of discrimination around disease against racial minorities, against sexual minorities, against the poor. Um, people without political clout have found themselves on the losing side of legal responses to epidemics, you know, basically since European arrival in North America. Um, uh, it goes way back. Um, and it's amazing the way in which disease has been a, a, a through line in that long history of discrimination that we really need to grapple with and that, that COVID has brought out again. You know, when you think about the racially disparate effects of COVID, the way it's affected poor communities, communities of color, uh, much worse uh, than middle class and, and white communities. It's really, it really brings that history back. Um, so that, that's, that's one that's one central piece of the um, of the ugly side of the history. Uh, I could have written a book that was just about the ugly side. You know, I really uh, found so much material there. Um, I also thought, though, that there was a that there was a contested politics of disease in our legal history, and that there were junctures where disease had revealed certain inequities that hadn't been as salient or hadn't been as clear uh, before disease rendered really evident just how poverty shaped uh, various communities. And so throughout the 19th century into the 20th, we see various forms of progressive reform designed to lift up the people who are the poorest in the community, in part because their health matters for everybody else's health. Uh, And so that that vision of solidarity holds in it a different kind of politics and to my mind, a more hopeful uh, legal approach. So both of those histories are in our past uh, and and I think they're in our present and and, and I'm sure both of them will be in our future. I just don't know what the ratio will be. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. Of course, you know, you're right. I mean, uh, people of color, uh, black Americans, uh, American Indians, uh, Latinx have really suffered, you know, four times greater hospitalizations, deaths, cases from uh, COVID 
uh, than the non-Hispanic uh, white population. So you're absolutely right there. And, you know, in terms of the bigotry, you know, uh, we've got a president now that, you know, is calling this, you know, the, the Wuhan virus, the China virus. How does that play into the bigotry? That's interesting. It, um, uh, there have certainly been moments for demagoguery around disease, you know, um, uh, going, going back, uh, scapegoating, long history of scapegoating. Uh, um, I think, for, for example, of the, you know, the, the, the fear around bubonic plague at turn of the 20th century San Francisco, which produced a targeted set of inoculation and quarantine orders you know, aimed exclusively at the Chinese population. In a yeah, way, I know that. Mm-hmm. Kind of an important case in our, in our history, and it um, reveals some of the, the ways in which particular populations could be scapegoated uh, in, in the process to advance various communities' interests and politicians' interests. You're just out of my curiosity, you're talking about the Jew Ho case uh, from San Francisco where they quarantined an area of San Francisco but, but left out, but only applied it to the Chinese American populations. The court struck it down saying it's a, an evil eye and an unequal hand. That was a local decision. Have we seen a president of the United States feed into the bigotry uh, in terms of uh, a pandemic and and the the kind of uh, inter intersection between scapegoating countries, peoples, uh, on the one hand, and public health on the other? You know, I don't I don't think we have. You know, it's always dangerous for a historian to say that there isn't a good precedent. That there are always resonances with the past. This particular feature. I don't know that we've seen as much. I mean, the the Wilson administration, President Woodrow Wilson, uh, during and immediately after World War II, faced a pandemic, the the influenza pandemic of 1918, 1919, and and Wilson is really thought to largely have stayed silent on the pandemic. Um, in part, it helped him uh, mobilize troops and send troops abroad without talking about it. There was lots of action at the state and local level. And, and our history is largely a history of state and local officials struggling with infectious disease, while the federal, uh, the, 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 while the feds stay out or have a peripheral role at the border since World War II with guidance and, and things like that. So uh, this is the first pandemic, I think, where a president has gotten centrally involved, um, uh, the first huge pandemic uh, in, in, in history. Yeah, you know, I, I was uh, on a panel the other day and they were talking about another great epidemic, maybe our last one, the AIDS epidemic, um, which is, you know, pandemic and still going on. Um, and they, you know, and this was somebody who was in the Bush White House and started PEPFAR, which is the big emergency program for AIDS, which is a great legacy for the United States and great U.S. leadership in, in global health. But he pointed out something that I thought was really interesting, which is, you know, that, you know, Reagan during AIDS um, like Wilson, in the way that you were saying, um, never mentioned AIDS, you know, it, but he didn't get in the way. He didn't, he didn't um, criticize science. He didn't, you know, castigate his or undermine his public health agencies. And so for this White House person under the Bush administration, he thought it was, you know, really, you know, unusual for a president to be so, um, you know, taking a stand against the big public health agencies, FDA, CDC, as we know with Tony Fauci right at the moment. Um, you know, is that your sense? You know, is it? That- well, part of it is that the presidency has changed in American history so dramatically in the 20th century, uh, and in particular in the, in the New Deal and post-World War II periods. So that the, the rise of the modern presidency comes in some sense after the first great age of epidemics and pandemics in American history. Uh, the, uh, you know, there's a, a wonderful quip in your field, really, in the, in the field of, of public health, that the 19th century was followed by the 20th century, was followed by the 19th century again. <laughs> so so the, the return of infectious diseases, the, re, the reemergence of some, the emergence of new ones, um, has, has put 21st century presidents in a 19th century setting. And, that's a new phenomenon for us. And, and no, it really is odd. What a great point, John. Because you I mean you know, we're we're really fighting at the moment until we get the vaccine and some really good treatments. You know, we're really fighting 
with 19th century tools. You know, we're, we're, we're quarantining, we're uh, contact tracing. We don't have a vaccine. You know, it's, we're, we're locking down cities. Um, and I'm going to get to lockdowns a bit later on, but let me start now. Um, but to drill down a little bit into your wonderful book, um, you know, you 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 talk about the police powers. You start with the police powers, and you know, police powers sounds you know really quite ominous. You know, it's you know, it conjures up a police state. But you point out that that's not the case. Is that right? Tell us about that. Right, so the police power, I think, is really a misunderstood piece of, of American history. And there have been some, some uh, historians work, at work for a couple decades now trying to, to tell the real story of the police power. The, the police power doesn't have anything to do with anyone in uniform. You know, it's, it's not about the state troopers or the, the cops on the beat. It, it's essentially the, the, the basic fundamental power of the collectivity to look out for its members. I mean, that's what we're talking about is the, 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 the authority of local and state governments to make sure that their communities uh, stay healthy and stay well, and to look out for them and help them to prosper. That's the police power. Uh, it is the constituent power of collective self-government. Uh, and it's at the heart of mm, political communities like ours. Uh, oftentimes we've, we've lost track of that, I think, over the course of history. And one of the wonderful things about doing the research for this book was just encountering in the 18th, you know, going back into the 17th century, but, but in the 18th and early 19th century, a plethora of examples of instances where state governments organized themselves around looking after the health and welfare of people in epidemics. That, that was central to, to self-government at the founding of, of this country. And it's interesting about the police powers because you start the book with an epigraph from Cicero saying health is the highest law of the land. And, you know, that does suggest to me what you said, um, which is, is that government has no greater power uh, or duty um, than to protect the health and security of our citizens. And a theory of democracy is that, you know, we there are a lot of things we can do for ourselves, but quintessentially, we can't stop epidemic diseases by ourselves. We need a collective um, to do that. So I think you know, police powers is important. The other, you make another important point about the police powers in the United States specifically, John, um, because you point out who holds that power primarily. Tell us a little bit about that because it's gonna be really important for a, Americans and, and the public to understand, you know, who's, who, who's in charge in this, in this pandemic? Well, well, Larry, you're right. One of the really peculiar features of American constitutional structure is that the federal government is usually said not to have the police power. The federal government has enumerated powers specifically listed in the U.S. Constitution, and the police power lies with the states uh, and subordinate to them, local governments. And so it's one of the reasons we've seen governors and mayors emerge over the last six, seven months as central actors in, in, our, in our pandemic is this, the, the police power goes to the states. Um, uh, it's, it's a distinctive feature, it makes us different from, uh, from lots of other countries around the world. Sure it does. And, you know, of course, um, you know, the federal government does have certain limited powers in terms of, you know, quarantine at the border, things you talk about in the book and, and, and potentially even to, to prevent a disease from going from state to state, but they haven't really used that very much. Um, it's also, I mean, I just, just to jump in there. I mean, yeah, yeah, please. I could, one could easily imagine a federal government that was much more ambitious than that and that tried to use its commerce power or its spending power to have a much more uh, contrary to the history uh, approach. Uh, we don't have anything like that now. And the, 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 neither presidential candidate right now is proposing to do either to do any such thing. No, of course. But Biden is suggesting a national mask mandate. And I'm going to get to that in just a minute. The, the, the interesting thing here um, is, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, discussion, you know, is American federalism partly to blame for what seems to be a, you know, fairly catastrophic failure by the United States per capita? Um, we're certainly in the top five worst performing countries and arguably in the top two. 
Um, and some people have said, well, look, you know, you know, this is because we've got, you know, 50 jurisdictions plus hundreds of cities and counties and sheriffs and, and you know, it's, it's you know, and we, we can't, we can't function that way um, without a national leadership. You know, do you think federalism has, has hurt us or has it been, you know, the great Brandeis uh, laboratory of the states um, where we innovate? Yeah, I think it's hard to say either way. It is, the historian's view is, is to say it has powerfully shaped our response. Uh, the reason I say it's hard to say either way is the federal government has a variety of powers that it could deploy uh, very, in, in, in very useful ways to help shape the United States' response to the pandemic. It could help solve collective action problems when states are peculiarly poorly situated to respond. So for example, in the acquisition of PPD, PPE, one could imagine the federal government taking a role there so as to resolve competition among the states. That's a, a really useful example. But you know, in a, in a moment of epidemic or pandemic, there will be regional variation. And so having the capacity to have regionally differing rules is really quite useful. And whether you do that from the top or whether you do it from the bottom, I think probably there are pluses and minuses. And I, I don't know that I'm the best uh, to, uh, to make that judgment. Yeah, you know, the um, PPE is a great example because as, as all of our listeners will remember, we've, we, we've had states competing for price uh, to buy PPE and ventilators and things like that. And that seemed to be so counterproductive. You know, there are federalist societies around the world um, that have performed very well, like Germany. Um, and some not so well. Um, so it's, you know, I guess it's, it is an open question, but, you know, one of the things that's on the top of a lot of people's mind, and in fact, a for, former uh, FDA um, uh, commissioner uh, recently did an op-ed um, where he called for a national mask mandate. Um, and Biden himself has called for a national mask mandate. I wrote an article in the Journal of American Medical Association saying, well, hold on, you know, does America, does the president have the power to do that? I mean, so, and this, this leads to a couple of things. Is it the president or must it be, must it be Congress? And secondly, even if it was Congress, um, do the commerce powers justify, it? how could we get more uniformity nationally, particularly in masks and other, uh, you know, protective preventive uh, mechanisms that we're trying to promote. Right, well, but my sense is the, the president's biggest capacity is the, is the bully pulpit, yeah. right? That is, is, the, is the, the power of the president to set an example, to model, to encourage, to, 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 uh, to, to exhort. Uh, that, that's where uh, the, the, the federal executive branch, I think may have it, its, its largest power. And there will be fine questions, nice questions, complicated questions. That's just lawyer talk, just complicated, hard questions about whether the Congress has the authority to impose a mask mandate across the board. In my sense already is that some of the proposals are narrow targeted mask mandates, mask mandates in federal facilities, mask mandates in, in interstate transportation, uh, things, places where the federal government has you know, obvious authority according to traditional constitutional uh, uh, standards. You know, why the federal, I mean, I'd step back and say, I think there are political constraints that will, that will stop a national mask mandate before we get to legal constraints. I just don't know that Congress wants to be in the business of enacting a national mask mandate when probably that kind of rule can be done pretty effectively at the state level is my own, is my own inclination. The federal government should set a good standard uh, and then th that kind of thing could, could, be left, could be left to states. Yeah, well maybe, you know, maybe if we had clear and consistent messaging from the top about masks, the bully pulpit, as you say, might, might do just the trick. You know, we're gonna have to see because a lot of people have thought that if everybody masked up, we, we, could, we could save tens of thousands of deaths. Whether that will happen in the United States, I don't know. And that, that kind of brings me to my next set of questions. You know, you, you, know, you talk about you know, various traditions in the, in the United States and in, in, our, in our history from the colonial period, you know, right on through um, to all of the epidemics and now um, to COVID-19. And you, know, you, you talk about you know, the, this kind of tug really more than a tug, you know, a real fight between uh, individual rights, civil liberties on the one hand, 
um, and the common good and, and population-based uh, health on the other. And, you know, the, the, you know, this, you know, most of us think, as you say in the book, and then go on to refute it historically, uh, most of us think that America is a, is, a, is a place of rugged individualism. And it does seem that way now when we look at all, how we've responded to COVID-19 as opposed to say Asian countries or even European ones. Um, but is that true? I mean, are we rugged individualists in our history and are we now? But that's a, the, the viruses bring out that in fact, rugged individualism is a kind of suicide pact. And, and our history, I, the, the founders of this, unit, of this country understood that really quite powerfully. I, I, it's, it's in, the 17, in the 1790s, you know, one in 10 residents of Philadelphia died of yellow fever. I mean, this was, we now have 0.1% of the US population has died of COVID in the last six months. 10% of Philadelphia uh, died. I grew up in a neighborhood that was the, the federal government's evacuation place for, um, uh, from Philadelphia uh, in the 1790s during yellow fever. So I, so I grew up with this in some sense, but um, rugged individualism is a terrible way to deal with, with, uh, with infectious disease and collective authority through democratic processes to help communities flourish is really the alternative. But one way to think about this is that we've had a myth in this country that freedom comes from the government staying out. Uh, you know, in moments of epidemics, freedom comes from figuring out a way to work collectively through the government to give us all the resources, vaccines and the like, that'll help us, that'll help us flourish. And that, that tradition runs deep through American history, uh, as deep, deeper than the rugged individualism idea. Yeah, you know, but, and I, and of course, you know me, and I, you know, that speaks to my heart. I totally agree with you. Um, but, you know, there, there are others that say that civil liberties matter more um, I actually wrote an autobiography in, in a journal of law and society entitled From a Civil Libertarian to a Sanitarian, because I was actually the head of the British ACLU and then on the board of the ACLU here. And now here I am, you know, a, a pure, you know, common gooder and collectivist, as, as, as you seem to be. But there is a tension here, isn't there? I mean, how do we, how do we get the balance right? Because you you don't want public health to be a license for trotting on liberties. You know, where where is the where where can we draw that line, and how do we know it's the right line? It's a, it's a great question, and the I think there's a hopeful thread in American court cases over the course of the 19th and into the 20th century on just this point. Um, it, we have, what we have is we have a tradition of courts reviewing public health decisions and insisting that they be rational, that they be non-discriminatory, that they proceed with the democratic authority of the legislature. Uh, and, and that tradition is, has been a way in which judges have overseen really vital public health measures to prevent epidemics and, and minimize their, the, the damage for epidemics without ever letting the supposed individual rights of the rugged individual to interfere with or block really vital public health measures that support the freedom of all of us. And that tradition is one that really comes out, comes out strongly. But one of my favorite cases for this is um, a case that, you know, you know, well, it's the Jacobson case out of Massachusetts. I was hoping you'd mention that case. Five. And so, so this, is a, this is the case that still today stands for the proposition that, that states can mandate vaccination in adult, in adult members of, of the American population, whether those adults want to be vaccinated or not, whether those adults have a medical reason for, um, uh, for, for, for getting out of the vaccine or not. Uh, and that, that case, which is decided, it's written by really great uh, justice on the U.S. Supreme Court, John Marshall Harlan in 1905. And, and, and that case announces that our freedom depends on our capacity to live together and, and, um, uh, and, and to, to protect ourselves from disease. But it doesn't stop there. And you know this as well as anyone, it doesn't stop there. It observes that there might be some situations where it would be arbitrary or capricious or especially cruel to administer a vaccine. And I understand that as the Supreme Court and Justice Harlan saying, you know, we're gonna stay involved. We're, we're gonna oversee and police and manage 
vaccine programs in the future, not to block them, not to stop them, not to insert our preferences over the preferences of the city of Cambridge or the state of Massachusetts, but, but instead to make sure that rationality and equality are respected. Uh, I think that's a really glorious and important tradition. Yeah, but uh, do you think it's going to hold up? I mean, is Jacobson going to hold up with a 6-3 conservative majority on the Supreme Court with a Justice Barrett on the court? There's a lot of uh, conservative scholars that are saying, well, you know, Jacobson deference to public health, um, you know, doesn't fly particularly in relation to you know religious liberties and and uh, even economic liberties, I'm I'm going to drill down into the religion and economic, but just a general sense now, whether or not uh, Jacobson is going to be robust, you know, in this next decade. Right. Well, you know, I mean, I think predicting how nine people will behave is a fool's errand. Yeah. But I'll say, I'll say it this way: uh, Jacobson is a charter of civilization. I mean, the, the, it's a little bit like uh, uh, authorizing a military draft. Uh, states that want to survive, I mean, states in the international sense, you know, the United States, nation states. If nation states want to survive, they have to be able to do the things that are required to respond to emergencies. And sometimes military drafts are required, and a well-done military draft might have a narrow conscientious objector provision, but, but judges aren't in a really good position to manage that question. Um, uh, and similarly, a nation state that wants to survive a pandemic has to be able to take the steps to mandate vaccines. So, so I think Jacobson's indispensable to our to our survival, and I hope hope, hope it'll survive. I love um, I love your term uh, charter of civilization. I think that's, a, and I agree entirely that you know as we're going to survive as a civilized, safe, healthy nation, uh, we need to as a collective, protect each other and the common good. And no better example of that is an epidemic uh, response. Um, so you, you talk in the book, you have actually separate chapters on each of these about the so-called um, quarantinist and, and sanitar- sanitarist states. Um, what did you mean by that? And if that's a true kind of two ends of, of a bookend, what, where are we now? So it's great, it's great question. The, the, the public health, the, 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 the history of public health is, is the way the literature tells the story is by talking about two different traditions. You know, one is, let's start with the quarantinist tradition. It's a tradition of, of harsh quarantines that manage and police bodies draw lines and boundaries, restrict sick people behind uh, behind uh, fences uh, and, and the like. And, and that, that's the quarantinist tradition, which runs through all sorts of government responses to epidemics in, in the past. The alternative tradition, the sanitationist or sanitarian tradition, is a tradition that imagines that disease comes not from infection among people, but from environments, and that managing the environments, improving the environments, is a better way than quarantinism to respond to disease. It, I, I use in the book quarantinism and sanitationism or sanitarianism as you know, somewhat synonymous with authoritarian approaches on the one hand yeah. and liberal approaches on the other. Uh, and that, that dichotomy runs through our history, through European history, uh, and all over the world. Yeah, I mean, and what do you think about lockdowns and, and you know, in looking at those traditions? I mean, we certainly saw, particularly in the great influenza pandemic, you know, cities closing off. But I wonder if could you have ever imagined that, you know, New York, uh, Los Angeles, Beijing, Delhi, um, London would be absolutely locked down in relation to a pandemic, even with all of your experience with you know yellow fever and smallpox does that surprise you or did you thought think oh well that that was going to happen well it took me by surprise and i think many members of my generation you i'm i'm born in the year in which the united states stops inoculating people from small for smallpox um, uh, people born, I, I'm born in February 1972, so I've got a smallpox swirl, inoculation swirl, but people born at the end of the year do not. Uh, and so my lifetime had, until, until now, it's been easy to understand my lifetime as the period in which we had defeated disease. Of course, those who were paying attention, like you, knew 
that that same period is the period of the slow reemergence and new emergence of various infectious uh, diseases. So, so you know, many of my peers hadn't imagined that we'd be in this sort of a lockdown situation. I guess historically, maybe we could have anticipated it. That is, the United States has a mixed tradition. We're partly sanitarian, sanitarianist, and we're partly quarantinist. We have both those threads running through our uh, running through our history. Um, relatively rarely, any well, never anything like the, the 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 travel lockdowns that we've had. Of course, we never had the kind of tra transportation technologies we have now uh, mm -hmm. during a moment of pandemic. So all these things have converged in this moment. Yeah. Well, I, I want to now uh, drill down a little bit even more to specific public health powers, um, you know, within those two traditions uh, and just get your take on them. Um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, quarantine um, and we started with, you know, the unusual case of quarantine, this mass quarantine, closing down big cities, countries, you know, it's really, uh, you know, something that, you know, boggles the imagination. Um, but quarantines themselves, just simply of individuals or, or groups that have been exposed to disease, go back centuries, don't they? Yeah, for sure. That is, I mean, quarantine is actually one of the classic powers of government uh, to just to to control the bodies of people under its jurisdiction in order to maintain the health. Now, of course, that power comes with huge risks because the power is awesome and so delivers the real risk of abuse, even as it's indispensable to our self-government. And, you know, Larry, that might be our, our fundamental dilemma here, is that power is indispensable and also incredibly risky, right? That's just, it's just true of, of, of human collective, uh, 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 you know, living together is incredibly risky and is indispensable. It's just what we have. There's really no other, no other choices. So what we've got to do is find a way to muddle through and I'd like to think that history has some really good examples of muddling through and also some also some terrible ones. So, um, yeah, no, that's great. I mean, that's a, I love I love the way you explain that is, it, you know, it's basically, you know, it's, you know, you know, quarantine is part of us as a civilization. You know, we can we can abuse it and we can and, but we need it and we need to live together. And and in order to live together, we need to keep each other safe. Um, so, you know, quarantine goes back centuries. What about contact tracing? You know, it's interesting as somebody that's worked in public and global health now for you know many, many decades, that all of a sudden everybody's a public health expert and things that we've been talking about for, for decades, like you know, testing, tracing, you know, these things, you know, social separation, you know, these things have been now they're in the common lexicon, you know, like I'd never thought I would see so. Contact tracing does go back in the American history with sexually transmitted diseases, AIDS, tuberculosis. So, you know, what did we learn from previous uses of contact tracing and what do you think are the benefits and the risks now? Well, the, I think we're at a really interesting and important juncture in the history of contact tracing and public health uh, around infectious diseases more generally for, for the last half century there's been a, 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 an idea coming to the fore, which is that civil liberties and public health might actually run together. You know, that actually maybe the best way to promote public health isn't to lock things down. It's to ensure that people who get sick know that they'll be cared for. It allows them to come forward, identify themselves. We can learn about diseases. We, we, maybe civil liberties is good for public health. But you know, new technologies are coming online and we're at a juncture where it could be that that idea of the synthesis of civil liberties and public health could turn out to have been contingent, a kind of accident of a particular mode of particular time in our history when we couldn't track people. But now let's think about the, the cell phone. Let's think about the, the tracing, the contact tracing and surveillance technologies we have available to us now. And that, 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 that means contact tracing is new now. It's not just a matter of sending out people uh, uh, by foot to figure out who who is near whom. Uh, uh, now we can do it through phones. And uh, um, that means we have the power to not only collect this information, but then store it. Uh, and I think that, I think we're seeing Americans have really complicated reactions 
to the the scary potential of uh, of contact tracing uh, in its new form. You know, in some ways, it's very old fashioned, uh, but its new form has all sorts of uh, uh, scary features. Yeah, you know, I was really glad you you moved there. I was about to get into the electronic tracing ideas. Um, but it's, before I even do that, you know, it's really interesting the fact that, you know, we're, we're actually not doing a lot of electronic tracing. We're doing, we're still doing 19th century, 20th century, you know, you know, uh, shoe and leather, you know, walking around and we're not doing that particularly well. But in the United States, you know, it's, we haven't adopted these kind of smartphone um, uh, location apps the way uh, China, uh, Taiwan, South Korea, and even in Europe um, have used um, because we're worried about privacy. Um, uh, we want to make it voluntary, but if it's voluntary, it won't work. I mean, and we also have molecular, I mean, genetic tracing, so we can kind of trace, you know, based upon genetic features of particular viral strains. You know, so why is America not embraced more um, the technology of tracing? Um, and should we? Well, we've had, um, I think it's in part about forgetting about the value of the police power. That is to say, what, co what, what old fashioned contact tracing is, is about person power. Right? It's, about, it's about building up a, a, the capacity of the state to have the human beings to make the phone calls, to do the, do the work, to, to have the shoe leather costs of going around and finding and tracking and tracing. And that requires people. It requires state governments that can, that can bring on board that kind of state capacity. You know, I'm, I'm, lucky, to teach enough, I'm lucky enough to teach at Yale University where we brought students back this, this fall. And we've got an extraordinarily effective so far. Can I, can I knock on wood on C-SPAN? Can I do this? Knock on wood, so far successful. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's here, it's October 26th. So <laughs> let's, um, let's hope this keeps working. But we've had, we have a huge number of contact tracers who've been able to, to connect people to uh, students who, when students have, have, have tested positive. And it's been extraordinarily successful for us uh, uh, in the last two months. We don't have that kind of capacity in our public institutions. And so one of the things this uh, pandemic is presenting the United States with is the value of state capacity so that our public institutions can do what some of our richest private institutions have started doing on behalf of their members. Yeah, so we can, you know, we, it certainly tells us we need to have a stronger public health infrastructure. But it still leaves open, of course, the idea of how we embrace technology. Um, very, very quickly, because we're running out of time and I've got so many more questions I want to ask you. You know, speaking of technology, you know, you talked about, you know, how the world has changed since flu and yellow fever with all of the globalization and the travel and things like that. But one of the core differences is now we have social media. We've got all of these conspiracy theories around COVID-19, vaccines, a whole range of things a lot of disinformation from the top of government that, that fans conspiracy theories. Um, you know, what do we make of that? How, how do we deal you know, with science and good health education and health literacy when we've got all of this, uh, un frankly, untruths just swirling all around us so that part of America has a completely different set of facts than another part of America. Right, well, there, there are some, there's some historical precedents for this. And so, uh, you know, one of the things one can find looking at cholera era newspapers in New York City is a conviction by the Democrats representing Irish immigrants who are my ancestors really uh, uh, in, in New York, you know, per persuaded that, um, uh, that public health measures are anti-immigrant. Uh, and, and stirring up Democratic voters against Republican-sponsored public health measures in, um, uh, in, in New York City and, 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 and Whig uh, public health measures in, in, in New York City. So, so we see that going way back. Um, and of course, it's also true that public health authorities have sometimes lied to people. 
that's also part of our history. You know, one of the ugly threads we started the, this program with was uh, the racism in public health and the infamous Tuskegee experiments running for what like four decades from yeah. the 1930s into the 1970s, in which uh, African American men were experimented on to see what the what the course of syphilis would be, uh, asymptomatic syphilis in, in their body. So, so America. And, just, and just to remind viewers, in that experiment, they had effective treatments and they didn't treat the African-Americans. They just opted not to do these, uh, yeah. really just dreadful. And so I mean, Americans know about that history and uh, the, the, that makes it all the harder to combat conspiracy theories and lies in the present. And the only thing, the only substitute I think for rampant conspiracy theories is, is trust in government and trust in scientific expertise. And we're at a really low moment for that. Oh. It'll be fascinating to see how the how the vaccine rollout happens. Uh, hopefully, in the coming in the coming months, and and, uh, and and trust is going to be indispensable. So we've got to figure out how to reestablish that trust. It's trust. You know, the, the the Center for Disease Control famously did work to establish trust for decades. I mean, it became a, a world respected institution based in Atlanta, and um, uh, and and the trust it developed was really quite important and uh, and, and vital. And hopefully, we can get back to something like that. I hope so. It just seems so, you know, the trust in CDC and our other public health agencies has plummeted. Um, and so I really do hope we can get back to that. I think that's, if I were going to say one thing that separates the countries that have done well and badly um, with COVID is adherence to science and trust in science and public health. The United States has not done well there. You know, we've talked about, you know, the, the, the police power side, and we've talked a little bit about the other, uh, the trade-offs with privacy and liberty, but let me just talk a little bit, get you to talk a little bit about specific liberties that I think, you know, will be very important with COVID, have been very important with COVID, and also with the new Supreme Court. You know, first, let's start with religious liberty. You know, the idea, you know, that, you know, should, should for, for vaccines, should religions be exempted or have an exemption? Um, should um, churches be exempt or, or from having to uh, abide by the rules of congregation, you know, and lack of public gatherings? Uh, these are things that have already come to the Supreme Court twice and very narrow five to four decisions with Robert siding with public health that might not happen in the future. Uh, how do we how do we think about you know the trade off between public health and religious freedoms? Well, it's a question that's surging to the fore in our in our in our politics right now. And we've got not just those two Supreme Court uh, uh, cases, but also circuit court uh, cases and the federal courts of appeals. So that this is really central, and it's not just central in in COVID litigation. It's become central in in de- in, in the regulatory state more generally. I mean, is, it's not a COVID problem, it's a regulatory state problem, yeah. how to think about religious freedoms. And I suppose the, the puzzle here is, on the one hand, religious discrimination is properly illegal and unconstitutional. And on the other hand, rules of general application need to be able to apply to all sorts of different spheres of life, religion being one of those spheres. And viruses don't stop at church house doors. And yeah. so uh, the, the challenge for the legal system is to try to strike this, strike this balance. And, and I know that some are concerned that religious freedom could be a new obstacle to, um, uh, to the establishment of really vital public health measures for precisely the reason that viruses don't care what religion we happen, we happen to have. And, and um, so, I, you know, I, it's hard to predict. The future historians should never predict the future if they can avoid it. Uh, but certainly this is going to be one of the, the central places, one of the central sites for us having this fight. Uh, is is that area of religious freedom. Yeah, and you know, most members of the American public don't even realize that this term in the Supreme Court um, with Justice Barrett uh, on it, um, they will be, they could be revisiting this idea of laws of general applicability and whether they apply uh, uh, in the religious context. So this is very real and very immediate and imminent and important and urgent. you know, we've only got, you know, a little bit of time left, you know, in about less than 10 minutes. Um, 
So I want to talk to, about something that I think is perhaps the most important part of your book, but and also the most important part of the COVID pandemic, which is equity and equality. You know, you started out this interview talking about the disproportionate impact on people of color. You know, we like to say, we've always said with tuberculosis and everything else, that, you know, basically infectious disease are the social leveler. Everybody's in it together, but are they? You know, some of us, you know, like at Yale, um, have one reality, and others, you know, like in uh, a, you know, a, you know, poor inner city neighborhood, or with a lot of essential workers and pe people with pre-existing conditions, have a very different reality. What What does this pandemic tell us about equality and equity? Uh, what can we learn from past pandemics, and what should we be doing? to prepare for a more just world going forward? Well, it's a, a really important questions. I think one of the things that we see in the pandemic is the inseparability of questions about health on the one hand from basic questions of economic justice on the other. I mean, it, uh, it's become incredibly clear that access to healthcare is a vital part of human flourishing and human freedom. And that really challenges some of Americans' traditional conceptions of what freedom is. People, usually, people in the United States have often defined freedom as keeping the government away. <laughs> but it turns out that, that in many ways, finding ways to get access to resources like healthcare, and oftentimes through the government, is indispensable to letting us be free. And that's one of the things that this pandemic has made salient. Let us see all the more. Um, when a vaccine is online, we're going to need to be able to distribute it. We're going to need to be able to administer it. And it's not going to matter, it shouldn't matter, whether people have the ability to pay for the vaccine. In fact, we all have a stake in getting everyone a vaccine. And of course, in public health questions, we oftentimes all have a stake in making sure that people have their, their, um, their health looked after. So I, I, I guess the, the thought here so far is a hopeful one I've shared, even despite the the miseries of the pandemic is that maybe we can see a little better the glaring inequities and maybe we'll be able to address them. We're certainly gonna have to address some of them uh, in the course of the coming uh, weeks and months. Maybe we'll be able to, maybe we'll be able to do a little better. Yeah, and of course, you know, I thought, I always thought even before COVID that the prevailing narrative in the United States and globally, frankly, um, was a narrative of inequality and inequity. People being left behind, and it's, and you mentioned access to affordable health care, but it's also uh, the deeper social, uh, economic uh, uh, factors, you know, of, of uh, you know, income, employment, uh, housing, things like that have really been quite striking in causing the inequities that we've got now. Um, and you also mentioned vaccines. You know, should, for example when we roll out vaccines, apart from the cost, let's say the cost isn't the barrier, but we've got a scarcity of vaccine, which we will at the beginning, um, should priority be given on the basis of race? The basis of race exclusively. I would think that priority should be given on the basis of vulnerability and and essential workers and the most vulnerable. Um, Does and that include race? I, I think it would end up producing a disproportionate racial effect, right? That is to say, if we identified the communities, I just want to start with the identifying the communities that have been most affected and reverse engineer the triaging rules from that. Yeah. Uh, now we know because of the statistics that that is highly likely in, in many areas to produce a, a vaccine program that would, would target uh, in, in, the, in the good sense uh, yeah. uh, uh, communities, of, communities of color. Yeah. So, um, my last question before I get to my really final question is this. Um, you know, the, it's really, I think, significant and, and meaningful that, you know, the two major social upheavals in the last year in 2020 have been COVID, uh, but also, um, you know, uh, George Floyd's murder and the, uh, and the, the protests about racial justice in the United States. Do you see those as entirely from a, an historian's point of view, but also a, an observer, an intellectual uh, observer? Are these related or are they totally separate? And if they're related, how? 
Well, I, I, I referenced the protests at the very end. You do. <laughs> I, I think I think they're connected. I mean, we um, uh, in the way in which we see terrible inequities becoming more salient than than at any moment in my lifetime uh, uh, through uh, through the, through COVID. You know, we it's it's one in a thousand African Americans have died because of COVID. I mean, that, that that kind of statistic is just it's just a stunning statistic that um, that uh, helps us see better some of the really terrible inequalities uh, in American society right now. And, and I hope readers of the book will see that in the book. We can see going back that time and time again, disease and our response to disease has exacerbated and highlighted those, uh, those inequalities and at the same time shown some possible ways forward uh, that, that will be better, better paths. Yeah, um, I mean, I think, you know, we, we're in the middle of a presidential election and, you know, one of the big debating points is, you know, whether or not the United States, you know, still is, has structural racism um, and how do we get beyond that structural racism? So we see, you know, a boiling cauldron of pandemics where everybody's life is, you know, gripped by this microscopic virus. At the same time, you've got enormous, you know, income and social inequalities. And you also have, you know, we're reckoning with racial justice. In an election year, you know, have we seen this before? You know, this kind of cauldron in the United States? Well, the, um, you know, I think of, I mean, one might think of the election of 1864. There's a smallpox epidemic in 1864, racing through the contraband camps, the camps of, of recently freed enslaved people who are behind union union uh, um, union detachments. So we've had these kind of conjunctures before. One mm, slightly hopeful piece is that in our version of it, more people have voice. And so we're, we're, we're able to see protests and, and, and hear voices that in a way, and certainly in 1864, we just, we just couldn't. And so I, we're grappling with things now. People have been able to put issues on the agenda that they couldn't before. And I, I think that's a good thing. It's a hard thing for a democracy, but it's a vital, indispensable thing. We just have to do it. You know, one of the things is, you know, we've seen a lot of social protests and we've seen political rallies um, and a lot of discussion has been, you know, can you carry on a political rally in an election season or can you protest an injustice in the midst of a pandemic? Is it safe? Is it? Oh, well, I mean, I guess you know, you'd want to talk to a public health expert, not a historian. You know, it's, there is a long history of conjunctures. Yeah. Political controversy and epidemics. You know, 1918, 1919 sees a huge outbreak of influenza, but also lynchings and, and racial pogroms, race riots. Uh, 1919 is a really dreadful year for African American communities uh, um, uh, in, in the United States. And so we've seen these conjunctures before. Uh, uh, social unrest is connected to viruses in all sorts of complicated ways. Uh, but both both helps to produce the opportunities for viruses. I'm thinking of wars here in particular, civil war, World War One, and then social unrest helps to you know uh, uh, produces viruses and then and then generates responses. Um, it's a uh, uh, there's a wonderful historian of, of epidemics named Frank Snowden, and and Professor Snowden's great idea is that epidemics and social structures go together. You have to study societies to understand epidemics, and epidemics to study societies. I think he's absolutely right. Yeah, so I'm getting to my last question. I'll preface it by this, and you can kind of respond to this and the last question, uh, which is, you know, after the great influenza pandemic, um, we had um, something that, you know, people say, well, was, what, what, did, what, what happened after that? It wasn't World War I, as you know, because that was going on at the same time. But we did have the Roaring Twenties. People got back. They socialized. And then we had the Great Depression. Um, so what is our future now? You, you know, I began this interview, uh, and thank you, you've been so eloquent, so amazing in so many ways, um, and I loved it. But you, we began by saying, you know, there were two paths, um, and then you hope we choose the wise path. Um, you know, what is the path, you know, 
what is the path we should choose? And, you know, and does history teach us anything? Will we, you know, will, will we become a, you know, a, a community knitted together by this or torn asunder? Well, uh, historians in the future are never a great mix. On the other hand, what else do we have to predict the future other than the past? There's really no, there's really no, really no choice. Yeah, there are really uh, um, inspiring pieces of our history. Uh, we have crucial members of the founding generation and the early U.S. Supreme Court, the, the greatest um, legal minds of the 19th century, organized themselves around the idea that it was indispensable that states and local communities have the power to respond rationally and effectively to public health and, and infectious disease crises. This infectious disease was, was, was epidemic in early America, not new to our history. So we can be inspired, I think, by the fact that, that our forerunners did respond to disease and found all sorts of valuable state power to do so. You know, on the other hand, we can do it better. We can do it better in the sense that we can learn from their mistakes and, and see the inequities they built into their responses. And, and, and I think there's a hopeful path ahead of us, one in which we can see the inequities that get illuminated by, uh, by public health crises and, uh, and address them too. So I, that's my hopeful thought. I, you know, but this may just be more temperamental, Larry. I'm just telling you that I'm an optimist, not, 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 not reflecting on the, uh, on the actual state of the world. There are also pretty, pretty terrible paths that, that could easily, dystopian paths yeah. that could easily come about, but let's, Let's hope. Let's hope for your optimistic path. Um, John Fabian Witt, what a wonderful interview. What a wonderful book, American Contagions. And, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're all, you know, trying to figure this out and just having somebody like you reflect on the past, the present and the future. It's just been a real treat. So thank you so much. It's a pleasure, Larry. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Send us an email at podcasts at c-span.org.